chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. That's Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And I'll be reading out of the New American Standard Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Thank you, Adam. Well, it is an exciting time. There's lots of good stuff going on, and so it's always great to be able to uh, see all the family and, and see different people, see different things that are happening. I did not know there was that many bowl games, though. So. Wow. So there's a lot of things that, don't, that do happen, and I want to go back and maybe take a little bit of a look at what it means to have faith in the darkness today. But right afterwards, right afterwards, meaning five minutes, maybe 10, uh, we're gonna be meeting for a teacher's meeting. And if you have at all considered teaching adult classes, um, I would like for you to come to room 104, just to let you know that, uh, to let us know that you're there, that you're maybe thinking about it. We're going to be having a training class in January. But this is just kind of to give you some insight into what's going on. Um, Dallas and I will be talking to you in room 104. And so uh, please come and uh, find out what's, what is going to be happening with our teaching and with education here at, at Mesa. And so that's just the plug for the morning. Um, as you look at the passage that we've talked about, it starts talking about God who created the heavens of, and the earth. And it really talks about the time when uh, God is there, when God, you know, his, it starts with in the beginning, and then God created, well, in order for it to be God, he had to be there before the beginning, right? Because in the beginning is when heaven and earth were created, and the earth, it says, was without form, it was dark, there is darkness everywhere. We very seldom understand what darkness really means. I know it gets dark here, at least the sun goes down somewhere around 536, something like that. But that isn't dark. There's lots of street lights out. There's lots of things that come on and, and we have lights usually with us and uh, it isn't dark. There's been a couple of times when we've been out far, far away from everything else that it really gets dark or maybe in the middle of a hurricane when all the lights in the whole city are out it's dark uh, because there is no light anywhere it's at those times that you realize what darkness is about and you realize how powerful it is that you really cannot function in it but the good part about this is we know that God is light in him, there's no darkness at all. He is always light. He has always been this way. He has always been goodness. He has always been kindness. He has always been love. There has never been any darkness connected with him whatsoever in any point at all. But that's not where the story begins. You see, the story begins with there was dark. The earth was created and there was dark and it was formless and void and uh, God said, let there be light. And so light was made. He called into being something that did not exist before this. And we see faith as a part of this process. And I want you to be able to understand that this is kind of the story of God that starts from this very beginning point when God being light himself says, you know, I started with dark. I started with a dark earth. I started with no shape. And I made order. And I made light. And I changed it from that darkness into light. 
into a place that was beautiful. I changed it into a Garden of Eden, and I even put people there, and, and everything follows after that light. And you can see all kinds of things that are happening there. And it's the story that repeats itself over and over again as you look through the Bible and, and try and understand there was darkness, there was gloom, there was sadness, there was something wrong, there was uh, despair. And, and you look at all these different times that we recognize in our life, and then God did something. And then God created. And then there was sacrifice. And then there was payment and then there was conquest and then there is this victory this light that comes afterward and he brings us out of darkness into his marvelous light and it's just kind of one of those amazing things and so creation is about bringing from darkness and void into garden of eden and when we look at all those things it's just amazing what god is able to do what I want you to realize today is that God does that every single time. That that's God's story. And he only tells it one way. And that's the whole thing. All the way through the Bible. You're going to see this in every single person, every single life, every single thing that God touches. He takes it from where it is dysfunctional and dark and he brings it into this great glorious light. It isn't that God rejects everything else that isn't him. It isn't that God says, I'm glory and all the rest of you just don't even measure up. You don't deserve me. No, God's story starts with he is light, there is dark, and he brings darkness into his radiance. And it's an amazing story when we realize how it all works. So how does faith interact with this story? How do we get faith into this part of it? Um, now, I understand also when you look at creation and you look at the end of that story, um, I'd have to stop at the end of chapter 1 to be able to do it right, or maybe chapter 2, but you certainly couldn't get into chapter 3 because by then you've got a serpent and then you've got a woman who listens to him and a guy who listens to his wife and it's just all downhill from there you know and that's what happens he says you know what there's all this other influence and God wasn't in the picture and they weren't listening to God and they were listening to Satan and so when we get into Satan's story we see it going the other way it goes from this beautiful creation of God and it seems to go backwards it seems to go toward darkness every single time and I'd venture to say that's the way a lot of people tend to live their life. They tend to live their life in the sense that, God, I need you. God, I want you. God, I, I, I want you to be part of my life until things are good. And once things are good, we go, okay, I've got it from here. If I need you, I'll call you. You know, so we stop coming to church because, absolutely, you know, things have gotten better. And so we don't really need anything now. We stop praying because we don't need anything more. But as soon as disaster hits, we go right back to it. And it's this whole thing of not realizing we're part of God's story that continues all the way through. When he gets us to that point, we've just become part of the great story of God. So how does faith enter into this? What I want you to look at is in Romans chapter 4 and verse 16. He's talking about Abraham and about what happens with Abraham, but he's really talking about creation. The first story, God creates Adam into God's story, and so it's not from darkness or anything like that. He starts with creation, but then it's not very long where... Everyone after him knows good and evil, and we always start from the dark. Romans 4.16 says, And that is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope he believed against hope 
that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. And so this is God's story. It depends on faith for this kind of story. He identifies this is about faith. God's always telling this. So what happens with faith? Well, faith usually means I'm going to believe in something that isn't here yet, that I don't see yet. And therefore, I'm going to imagine it can be possible. I'm going to believe it can be possible. I'm going to think that someone else can handle it. And sure enough, it it works. It becomes real. And God does this all the time. And this is what we see happening. But that's also the same story as what God does. It does not exist yet. It isn't there yet. God imagines it to be there. He sees, he speaks, let there be light, and light happens. It's really a definition of faith. It's really what faith is all about. And as you look at this part of Romans where he's describing Abraham, he says Abraham believed God. God was going to make him the father of many nations. That's kind of the end of the story. Because God is able to do all of these things. God's able to give life to the dead. God's able to call into existence things that do not exist. And when Abraham starts believing in that, he starts believing in something that can happen that he cannot see. He starts believing beyond his own darkness, beyond the place where he is as a God who's able to bring about these things. He knows the God of creation is able to speak and light will happen, and light comes out of darkness. He says, I don't have a son. I don't have a son with Sarah. She's the one I love. He's, she's the one that has been promised, and God has said, I'm going to give you a son. In fact, I'm going to give you many nations, and they're all going to come through Sarah. He goes, but it's impossible. He tells him that when he's 75. That's bad enough. And then it gets worse every year after that, right? How long do we keep the nursery? Are you going to give that room up and say, well, let's make it a spare bedroom? Uh, No, no, it's a nursery. We're keeping it as a nursery. Of course, then you've got to convince your wife that this is going to happen. And so that's a whole other uh, obstacle in itself. But he believes God and says this is going to happen. And it doesn't happen until he's 100 years old. But because he believes God, who was able to bring into being things that do not exist, Abraham says, that's what I do too. I believe that something will happen that God has proclaimed, that God has promised, that God has announced, and it will happen. We call that faith. And that's what Abraham does with all of this. And so as you look at this process and look at how he describes God here and the process that God goes through, it's amazing to be able to look at how all of this happens and how all of this works. Faith is seeing light when you're in your heart when all your eyes see is darkness. That's really what it's about is being able to realize the light is out there and I'm not there yet, but I know it's coming. I know it's going to be there. I know it's going to be part of life. And that's part of what we realize with all of this. Romans 4 and verse 19. Okay, let me read the last half of that. In verse 19, he says, He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in faith, and he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. He wasn't able to do it. He says, I understand, I can no longer do this. It is impossible. That has nothing to do with reality. Does that make sense? The impossible has nothing to do with reality. We get told this all the time. You might as well face reality. 
And when they're talking about God and talking about things of faith, it's like, no, you don't understand. I'm facing the reality that I have a God who's big enough to tell his story in my life. And his story in my life is that he takes things that don't have, that are darkness, that are despair, that are depression, and he brings them into light. And I believe God is able to do that. This is one of those examples where it was impossible, but it says there was no unbelief, no doubt, no wavering in his heart at all. That God is able to do this. And so that's the link with the story. And so many people after him tell exactly the same story. It's what you have in your Bible. That's what makes up the entire book for the most part. It's when we're able to see this. When you look at how faith is seen, it's the light in your heart. It sees what you know, what you believe. You get to another story and there's Noah in the middle of a wicked world. Well, how is Noah ever going to convince this wicked world? He's not. He preaches for a hundred years and does the world change? Not at all. But God is able to bring light out of that kind of darkness. There's so much violence in that world and God is able to say, you know what, I'll take away all of that sinful world. Noah, you just build the ark. And Noah finds himself at the end of that time in a world full of family and righteousness. What an amazing thing to see God at work. Joseph is sold as a slave and he ends up in prison in Egypt. Looks like a pretty bad start. Comes from a very dysfunctional family. Lots of hatred, lots of jealousy, lots of competition that goes on there. But he believes in God who's promised and faith wins in the end. It's where we join the story that is the most difficult part. When we think about God and we're sitting in darkness, we cry out to God, God, I want you to deliver me. God, I want you to fix all this. And then we say, well, God, you didn't do it yet. So obviously you're not even there. You're not paying attention. You're not even listening. No, you got to just realize that that's the part of the story we're in. He's in the part of the story that says, and there was darkness. And the next part of the story is, and God does something. And it's true in every single person's life. When you wake up, do you wake up at the beginning of the story, in the middle of the story, or at the end of the story? You probably have events in your life that you can look back on and say that was a very dark time. It was very difficult for us to get through that. Very difficult to deal with. And yet now, it's easy. Because it's already over, it's already finished, it's already done. And there are times like that when you can see that, yeah, it's already worked out. But when you wake up in the middle of one of those and realize, I need God now, boy, it can be scary, can't it? It can be really threatening. And sometimes we doubt. We see Israel when they're slaves in Egypt. God says, I'll bring you out. Really? I mean, there are only 70 people going in. There are like 2 million coming out, and you're going to bring them out? Sure, let's go camping. We're all going to camp from here all the way across Sinai Desert. And it works. And he does. Even when they don't believe that, it does. Because they keep waking up going, we're in a desert. He says, no. You're going to a promised land. And they see it as, no, we're in a desert. But the reality is you're going to a promised land. And faith sees things different. They get to the edge of the Red Sea and it looks like it's impossible. Egyptians are coming behind them and God says, go forward. There is no forward. And he just splits it and says, okay, now there is. And we see miracles like that and we hear things like that and we realize that that is the story of God every single time. He may let you get in a place of darkness. We may put ourselves in a place of darkness. 
but it always is God's story that it leads to light. David and Goliath, there's a huge threat. Goliath is so big and no one can defeat him. Well, sure they can. If you've got a 45 caliber rock <laughs> and a little bit of faith in God, Daniel, as he is a teenager, at least a young man, and taken captive, it looks like everything is lost. His whole nation is carried away to another place, and there's not a single thing left. And you might as well give up and serve some other god, right? And he says, no. He's given the choice place to say, you can have all the best food, all the greatest privilege of being in the king's house because you're one of the cute ones, you're one of the smart ones, you're one of the good ones. And so, and he says, I'm not touching it because that's not what we eat. I want to eat what God would want me to. He doesn't give up his worship practices, even though it looks pretty dark. Why am I worshiping a God who has allowed my nation to be captured and taken away into captivity? And he knows the answer is because, well, <laughs> we all sinned. And we put ourselves in this place. But I know the story of God. It goes from darkness to God's intervention to light. And the story is the same every single time. And so you see Daniel, whether it's eating the king's food or whether it's being able to pray with his windows open, he prays. It gets him to a lion's den, yeah. And that looks pretty dark. But he says, I'm just waiting for the end of the story. The same with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're not bowing down to your idol. Same captivity. And then you get to the between the Testaments. And God doesn't say anything for 400 years. You know what it's like when people don't talk to you. When they don't say a word, and you wonder why they're mad, what's wrong. And God's just waiting. What if you woke up in that time? When God is completely silent, he's not saying a thing. We've got lots of prophecies about a Messiah coming, but we have no clue. And then John comes and he says, I'm going to tell you there's one coming. And then Jesus is born. Doesn't seem like a fix, does it? When you've got a child who's born... But from where we are now, we see the greatness of what Jesus was able to do. The thing I want you to realize is all of them did not survive. Does that make sense? I mean, it's easy enough to paint this and tell you all the good stories. And uh, yes, they all got better. And every single lion's den and fiery furnace you find yourself in, every single difficult situation you will get out of and God will deliver you. But... There's also a couple of passages that you might know that says, you know what, they weren't all delivered. Hebrews 11 is one of those passages. At the end, he's already talked about several people who have had this great time when God has brought light into their life. And he says, and what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Wait a minute, we had all those good stories, right? And he starts out with good ones, Gideon, Barak, Samson, man, the great strong guy, single-handed, don't you wish you were that strong? And you could go to the gym and you could lift any weight in there. Max them all out, watch this. And it's not about being able to show off for anybody. 
The list is incredible. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, endured, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the sword, made strong out of weakness, they're mighty in war, they made foreign enemies run away. Even when a child died, they came back by resurrection. It's an incredible promise of God. And then he goes, and some were tortured and refused because there's a greater light coming. There's a greater place of light to rise again to a better life. Because it is not just about this life or the time that we have here. And if that's all our existence is about, then maybe, maybe that we would try to win here. But God's not always about winning here. He's about winning the final victory. I saw this. I used to be afraid of the dark until I learned I am a light and the dark is afraid of me. We need to realize the power of God. We need to realize that faith in God brings about all of these great things that he talks about and maybe it's going to be conquering kingdoms and stopping the mouth of lions and doing some things that are incredible like that or maybe it's the fact that we go through it all and we get to the point where we realize there's a better life coming. There's something else there and that's what Jesus did as he went to a cross and glory because we understand where glory lies and it's not just about winning everything here but it's about being able to experience it there. And so we want to be filled with a heavenly light to go where God is to this new place where there's no sun because the Lord is the light. And we go there as people who have come out of darkness, as people who have struggled, as people who have been through all these things before, but now we are able to see the greatness of God who calls into being things that do not exist because our goodness may not exist right now but God calls into being forgiveness and redemption and goodness and mercy and justice because that's who he is Colossians chapter 1 and verse 11 this is the middle of a prayer that Paul is offering he says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What a great passage. What a great thing that realizes that's what's going on now. That's part of that battle that's going on where we're transferred from darkness into the kingdom of his son, into a kingdom of light, into a kingdom where the glory of God is able to shine. We're strengthened with all power. We have to have this endurance and patience and joy, and that's the reason he strengthened you, is so that you have enduring joy and patient joy not patient frustration, not enduring frustration, but patient, enduring joy because he delivers you. Yeah, there's something to be delivered from, from this kingdom of darkness that seems to have hold over us and we're transferred into the kingdom of his son and we find redemption and forgiveness of sin. So let me just ask you about your story this morning is it full of darkness is that what it's about are you just cursing the dark and wishing God would fix it praying God please fix my life because my life is broken I want you to know that he already has that's already been taken care of and it may not be your life that's broken it might be you because when you join his story he changes from darkness 
to redemption to light. But we keep insisting, my life is bad, my life is bad, it's not me. And it doesn't really get us to the place where we want to be because we're insisting on living our own story. We want control. And as soon as you realize, I need to join God's story, everything changes. Let him strengthen you. Let him make you clean. Let him fill you with his spirit and change your story. And maybe that starts with simply baptism and repentance and getting into God and finding his grace and forgiveness. Or maybe it starts with reading your Bible more and being able to understand where you are in your life and how he is going to bring light out of this darkness that you're facing. Or maybe you're just able to sit here and say, you know what, things are great. I'm just going to rejoice in the light for as long as it possibly lasts because I know how things go. And there are times when it's going to be good. And there are times when God's going to work a miracle. Those are the two times. All of it is in the power of God. Today, if we're able to help you with this process so that you realize the greatness of the story of God, let us know. Come forward. Let's stand and sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did! My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love. Amazing grace, the Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be. As long as life in the earth shall soon be Oh.
Good to see all of you here today. First, I want to say, uh, let's see, Jesse Henley was baptized on Wednesday night, for those of you that don't know that. So praise the Lord, Jesse. Uh, let's see, we got some friends that want to place membership here today. I think that's wonderful. Uh, the Ingalls, Mark, Allie, Brooke, Alice, I mean, uh, Lindsay, and Mason. So if they'll stand at this point, right, Mark, it's okay for you to stand, brother. <laughs> we're glad to have you here. So we look forward to uh, more, uh, to bring more to you later on. So a couple announcements we got. Uh, Lisa Finmix will be having a uh, test on Monday uh, in Phoenix. So pray that uh, she overcomes her anxiety. Uh, when these tests are reformed and, and get hopefully good results. So, Lord bless you, Lisa. Uh, Carl Goodman says that my mother Carol is having some health issues and will be doing some tests on Monday. Would like prayers for that. Uh, Linda Campbell says, I uh, want you to pray for me. I'm looking at a, a position there at the company where I'm at. And so pray that she gets it. So Lord bless you in that, Linda. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we just cannot tell you enough how much we love you. And Father, how much you give to us each and every day. So Father, we ask that you just bless these people that I just mentioned. That you be with them that you heal them, and Father, that you heal any others that are not, that are on our list, and Father, that you bless them. And so, God, we're so thankful we can call upon you and call upon that great name of Jesus for the healing power. And Father, we ask that you especially be with Lisa, Father, and that uh, take away that anxiety and that you be with her as she goes through these results. I know Dorothy is having surgery tomorrow on her hip. And Father, we pray also for Joshua and his uh, problem with his blood pressure right now. And so Father, we ask that you watch over him. And Father, we thank you for the day and for the being able to sing your praises and to honor you today. Thank you for Jesus. And it's in his precious name we pray, amen. I know worship isn't for me or for you, but I gotta tell you, it was fun today. I appreciate you guys, huh? especially that last one. You guys the loop. That was fun. Sung two different songs at once. Um, we're gonna sing a, the same song together just to end here. Uh, Living by faith. Let's stand. I cannot do this with the heart of a green shadow of sunshine or rain. The Lord I will rule with for everything, and all of my worry is vain. The living by faith in Jesus above, for us he confides in his great love. For a moment's sake, 
Thank you, Terry, for that, that lesson. Um, you made me change what I was going to pray this morning. The, uh, the thought came to me, and I'll try to be brief, but have you ever seen silver in the raw as it comes out of the ground? It looks kind of green, and then there's dirt and other rocks mixed in with it. And the silversmith will take it and grind it down, pound it down, and put it in a steel pot, and then fire it up, heat it up. Turns into molten. And you take a, a, a ladle, a kind of a spoon, and you, you stir it around, and you kind of agitate it, and all the impurities rise up to the top, and he'll take them and, and skim this off, and he'll keep doing that until it's pure. You know how you can tell when it's pure? It's pure when he can see his reflection in the silver. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for making us pure, and thank you for the light that you've created, God, and help us to reflect your light of Jesus to all those around us. In Jesus' blessed name, amen.